Thank you very much, Sunanda and Dr. Tartar, uh, Dr. Cabral, Max Tegmark, Dr. Tegmark, and Dr. Bartia. It's been absolutely fantastic having you all speak with us today on this important question about the meaning of the search for life in our universe. And we're now going to transition to a discussion of what will it take to support human life in this near Earth cocoon of low Earth orbit right around our own planet. And we're delighted to have an opportunity today to be in conversation with Michael T. Suffordy, President, CEO, and co founder of Axiom Space. I'm now going to introduce Mike, talk a little bit just briefly about Axiom, and then we'll pass the baton to him for the first question. So, Mr. Suffordini co founded Axiom Space in 2016 to make living and working in Earth orbit commonplace as a means to a new economy in low Earth orbit. Mr. Suffordini has 30 plus years of experience in human spaceflight and served as NASA's ISS program manager for a decade prior to his retirement in late 2015. As ISS program manager, Mike was responsible for the development, assembly, operation, and utilization of the International Space Station. During his tenure, Mr. Suffordini successfully led the transition of the ISS program from a development and assembly focus to a research and commercial utilization focus, thus opening avenues for a new commercial marketplace in space. And I'm happy to say that we, the Space Exploration Initiative, have been the benefit of much of Mr. Suffordini's work as um, one of the you know, many groups that has sent research to the International Space Station. Mr. Suffordini is the recipient of numerous awards, including the NASA Distinguished Service Medal the NASA Outstanding Leadership Medal, the National Air and Space Museum Trophy, and timely for this week and last week, the Yuri Gagarin Medal. Now with that, for anyone who does not already know, you should, uh, who Axiom, the, what Axiom the company is, Axiom Space offers end-to-end -end missions to the International Space Station today, while privately developing its successor. Their intent is to move towards a permanent commercial destination in Earth's orbit that will sustain human growth off planet. And with that, I'd like to welcome Mike. Hello, can you hear us? You have had a really amazing career. So let's start with your background. You've had this impactful career at NASA and of course are now leading Axiom, a company at the vanguard of expanding access to habitation and orbit. Tell us about your vision for humanity's horizons. What's driving you in your work? So when we started the company, it really was because of what had gone on in the International Space Station and knowing that there's this incredible, there's incredible uses for uh, the microgravity environment that is around uh, our planet, uh, both commercially and, and really to support exploration in the future as well. Um, but with the ISS ultimately retiring, uh, we knew there needed to be a, a, a spacecraft to follow. Um, and the, the government wasn't going to do that. And so uh, Dr. Cam Gaffarian, who at the time owned a company called SGT, that was uh, really the operations company that, that trained astronauts and operated the International Space Station. And I got together and, and we formed this company with the idea that we would build the infrastructure in space to allow this evolution and growth of, of this economy that wasn't going to keep going if there wasn't something to follow the International Space Station. And in the process of doing that, it's become very clear to us that um, there just wasn't um, enough opportunity to, to come to space and utilize the infrastructure that is the International Space Station. It's very busy, and uh, the, the 15 countries that are involved all have uses for it. And so it's become you know, quite the challenge to utilize it, to be able to utilize it by other than just the countries uh, that have it today. So really, the, what really sparked me uh, was the, the advances that could lead to all the opportunities for manufacturing in particular, although other countries want to go and there's exploration opportunities and quite a bit of research that gets done, we all know. I really think it's the manufacturing of products in space, both for in-space use and for use for, for us on the ground is is where where it gets really exciting great to hear and i do think there's this you know fantastic potential for growth in some of these different sectors that you're mentioning tell us a little bit more about how axiom fits into this so give us the 10 or 20 years out vision for life in orbit if our audience members were going to embed you know as space tourists or space workers on your future station what what do they have to look forward to tell us where axiom fits into this so we are building a, you know, for us, 
this is the beginning of a of a lifetime uh, for humanity in in the low Earth orbit, and and we have this sort of existential look at it. Like for us, we're this is really the first step of humanity. So if you look at at exploration in the past, anything going west, the railroads, any, anything really, you start off with government, usually government funding funded efforts, and uh, with very very high risk, generally speaking, uh, and that's the exploration phase. And then really the next step after that is the pioneering phase, and really that's where individuals, we'll say common people like you and me, would would although brave or or have other attributes that that cause them want to go forward, but that really is the, the next step and really the step towards settling. And so that's what this is about. This is about the continual continuation of a home in space and the really the first step for, for humanity to, to live permanently in space. And it's, it's bigger than that, of course. It's all the reasons that you're in, in microgravity. And so we feel strongly that the International Space Station, in order to be effective in its later years, there has to be a transition from the International Space Station to a commercial station. That's why our station is attaching to ISS first and will grow on ISS when ISS is ready to retire. Everything that's on ISS can be moved over. And when we separate, it's just a continuation. Just imagine if I was at ISS was going to end, people doing research or even manufacturing, if they're not going to be on orbit for a while, eventually they're just they're going to stop flying. So if you were going to end ISS in 2028, by about 25, you'd start losing customers. And we think that's a that would be a major loss in terms of the economic growth in low Earth orbit. And so the evolution that we're, we're working on is this idea of building first a, a platform that's multi-use. So, you know, we all know about tourists. Uh, there's many other countries that want to, to utilize space uh, for the benefit of the country and, and the planet as a whole. It's also an opportunity for, for us to continue to lead more countries, a larger partnership to do exploration, which is very, 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 very important to us. Um, and then, of course, you have the continuation of the research, uh, all the opportunities for manufacturing. Of course, there's a lot of applied research that happens as we figure out what will work in space from a manufacturing standpoint and what doesn't. Um, of course, exploration can't happen without a low Earth orbit platform to test systems, to, to mature systems, to let astronauts get experience, to, to test longer and longer durations in space to equal those for whatever trip we take. We all talk about Mars, but eventually we'll go even further. So there will need, there will need to be this platform. So our first platform will start off very multi-use. And our vision of the world is you probably evolve to very uh, specific platforms for a specific job. So, uh, you, know, you know, the easiest one that makes me bristle a little bit because everybody focuses on tourism, but that's one you could ultimately have a hotel in space that's very specific to taking care of people. Um, manufacturing is the one I think we're eventually having manufacturing, smelting or anything like that with a whole bunch of other people around is probably not great. The microgravity research guys are going to want their own platform that's very, very quiet in space. So the evolution being very purpose-built platforms, and ultimately for us, our vision of the world is we're going to evolve to a platform where you do have a large uh, rotating section. I think our initial design is about 300 uh, meters across, uh, rotates about uh, two RPMs, gives you about eighth of a G. Um, and the, but the center section has to stay stable. It can't rotate like in all the movies. The center section also moves. You really can't do that. You lose microgravity, and you have to ask yourself why you're there in the first place. And so that's a. It's going to be a very sophisticated challenge to do that. But when you you set it up that way, then then when people go to work to space, their families come, and you can have schools in the rotating sections and parks and movie theaters and all those sorts of things. But the center is where you know. You, you go to work every day. And so for us, that's kind of the evolution over the next, not 20 years, but really 50 years, where we get to this point where we establish kind of a, a city in space uh, to support everything, both on the ground, in low Earth orbit, and then ultimately for exploration as well.
I think it's a really compelling vision that you're building out. And this was going to be one of my questions for you later, which is, is it too early? Is it presumptive to start thinking about space urbanism and the questions that we'll have to answer when there might be more than one commercial space station in orbit, or there might be resource sharing or traffic management or waste stream management, utilities management, and the way that we have these interesting um, challenges that face urban environments with your vision of, you know, in the future, this is not just, I love the framing of a space home, but it's also a space laboratory, um, and it can become the proto core of a space city. How far away are we from that vision? Is it too early to be thinking about those things? Or are these already the questions that are, are coming to your mind for the next few generations of Axiom? Well, you know, the whole institute that you have is really focused on, on what the future is. And you got to try to imagine the future to know what your next step is going to be. So to me, it's not too early to think about that. And in fact, when we, we did, uh, we, we, in fact, it was the first uh, privately funded study at the uh, Space University, um, International Space University. This was a few years ago, and we had them study this idea of a city in space. This is the rotating platform I was telling about, city in space. And it was important because it brought up a lot of things I didn't even think about, like like how how do you manage it? How how do you? Is it if it's if it's going to be many many countries? Is it is it its own city? Does it have its own government? Is it commercial? How does it work? And and we've talked to a lot of those things. And it's, it's interesting when you're talking about infrastructure because it does kind of make sense that you would create it as sort of its own state, if you will, that taxes, there's, there's taxes for land that you might own. And, uh, but then as a business, you sell your services. Um, there's a lot of questions about monopolies that, that can be created that you want to try to avoid that. You want to try to have competition where you can and manage where you have to have them up, please. So it's, you know, it's not bad for everybody else. But, but this is all the sort of things we should be thinking about right now as we evolve. So we know, we know the ultimate, the ultimate destination. And I, I don't know that, the, that, you know, the city and space thing is, is the ultimate answer. I, I think it is, but, you know, we've got, we've got uh, 10 or 20 years worth of stuff in front of us to to see what comes out of this. I mean, this is a lot like the internet when you think about it. The internet, we imagine, oh, this is cool. We're, everybody's going to have all kinds of free data on the internet. That's what we imagined, right? And and it turned out to be data and access. And so any kid with a good idea and a little bit of programming skills could create a dot-com. And it was we, we never, I don't think anybody really imagined what, what the internet's turned into today. And I think the same is true with this boundless amount of microgravity that, that exists in, in low Earth orbit. It's a little different because it's a little more expensive to get involved in, and we're working on that aspect of it. But, uh, but it's going to, it's going to ca cause thoughts and ideas and practices that we haven't imagined yet. And I think that's, that's really the key um, and as that occurs over the next several years, it will dictate where we end up. But I think we should think about where we believe this will go. And we need to think about it in broader terms. I think we need to think about it more holistically. We really shouldn't explore beyond low Earth orbit as a handful of countries. We need to explore as, a, as humanity and, and really anything we do, eventually we need to con not consolidate the wrong word, but we need, as we take our first steps off the planet as a species, we should do it together as a species, not as, a, as one or two uh, countries that tend to have more wealth than the rest. Mike, you're touching on some wonderful points that we've heard earlier in the day as well. We had a few lightning talks discussing the future of space governance, democratic norms, collective multi-stakeholder interaction in these very confined spaces like space habitats, but also planning for activity on the surface of the moon. And the panel right before you thinking about the future of life in space brought up this responsibility that we have as earthlings. And it's fantastic to hear you echoing that back to us that, you know, you as a Vanguard space company going out and thinking about uh, working and operating in low earth orbit, still understanding that it's a domain in which we should be exploring together as an international uh, collaborative, which is really fantastic to hear. You've now painted a picture for us of some of the different pieces that have made this the right time in the industry for your work for Axiom. And of course, you guys have just raised a very impressive $130 million Series B and have announced the first civilian launch to the ISS for early next year. 
what more could be happening, whether it's at NASA or in industry or in academia, to support this work? What more could be happening in the space industry across the board to make us more likely to get from where we are now to this far out vision that you were describing for Axiom's long-term ideas? Well, I, I really think the, the most important step for us is to get the government seriously behind commercialization. So it's one thing for, for our senators and congressmen and women to talk about, um, you know, how much they like commercial space, but it's another thing to put policies in place that allow agencies, the Commerce Department, NASA, of course, state, to support these efforts and provide the extra uh, help, I'll call it help, that's necessary for uh, entities that want to explore space to, to be able to do that in a reasonable way. Now, now we, we grew up as a company saying, you know, really this can't, this cannot, the development cannot be done uh, by the government. The development has to be done commercially because when governments get involved, there's a, there's a lot of reasons why it's difficult uh, but the, one of the biggest challenges is intellectual pro protecting intellectual property and being able to evolve from that. And so we've been a big, big proponent of don't let's not do this NASA pays for development thing. Let let's let's make companies that are interested do the development. There's a there's a couple of other reasons why you do that, but that doesn't mean that the government doesn't have a role to help. Uh, entities uh, like ourselves, and there's, you know, there's a number of them out there that are that are looking at things like Axiom is doing, and um, and so I think that's probably the most important next step is to get a no kidding grassroots government support, and then once we do it within our own country, we need to work with perhaps the partnership countries first, and then evolve out from that to get other governments set up the same way. So they create, there's incentives, there's tax incentives, there's, there's particularly for NASA, there's things that go on in ISS that, you know, there's no need for them to be charging for if it's, if it's helping grow commercial economy. Um, so there's, you know, there's a number of things that can happen, but I think the most important next step for us is get a seriously, get the government behind this and, and enact uh, laws and statutes that, that help us uh, be able to help uh, create these opportunities in space. That's at least from our perspective. Mm -hmm. And in one of your prior comments, you raised the prospect of the Axiom community in the future also being one of international access, that there are a lot of other countries and other nationalities that might be interested in using your platform as a lab or for other purposes. When you think about the support that you need from the U.S. government, my understanding is that Axiom is trying to pioneer potentially a, a new approach to ITAR and export control and how we think about being able to really do international collaboration. Uh, can you share anything right. on that on that point? How are you thinking with Axiom of being able to continue in some ways the wonderful precedent set by the ISS and so much international collaboration there, but even take that to the next level? Yeah, so, so key to uh, our business plan is the international aspect. And of course I came from the International Space Station program. So right away, it was pretty easy to at least, there were at least 14 other countries I, I knew close enough to, to start working with them. But there's others involved too, and it's it's interesting because you do run, as you said, ITAR is a, is a big challenging issue that we have to work through. And ITAR is not something that you can wave away, it's something you have to figure out how to deal with. And it's about protecting, um, Again, it's just like intellectual property. We find that those are so closely aligned, uh, even though what one does is, is really done on, on behalf of protecting the country, really. And in the other case, it's really meant to protect uh, commercial entities. But they, they're both the same thing. It's about not revealing uh, secrets, we'll call them secrets, not revealing information that, that is in, in it that's not appropriate to reveal but being able to allow everyone that, that wants to utilize your station to be able to operate in a secure manner so they don't accidentally get their data compromised or their information compromised. And so, yes, we're working on that. It's one of probably one of the biggest challenges that we have to deal with. So far, country to country, and we've, we've talked to a lot uh, of countries, and in fact, we're working on um, recently, we, we bought a, a Soyuz seat 
that NASA ultimately needed, and we traded the seat that we bought to NASA for a 180-day increment flight in 2023, and we're selling that to a country. And so far, those kinds of things have been relatively easy to do. But eventually, when we start talking about um, the design and development of our spacecraft and, do, and, and involving other countries in their efforts, so that's an important part of our station, that we're not the only country developing our station. For instance, the, the shells are produced, at least the first three are produced by uh, Tazi Alinea Space in, in Italy. And, and uh, so right away, this is a, a case where you have to protect and make sure that we're not uh, violating any, any laws. Um, and of course, many of the systems have very sensitive in nature. So these are all things that, we, that we're dealing with. And, um, and, and it's just, it's, it's the nature of the beast. It's what we have to tackle in order to, to make this work internationally. And we, we won't be successful if it's not international. Thank you for giving us some insight into that. And of course, at MIT, we are fortunate we have this opportunity to also welcome international students. And it's been really important for my group to be able to be diverse in that regard and to work really closely with different international groups. And we've had the pleasure, absolute pleasure, of working with NASA, but also with ESA uh, and JAXA and other agencies. And I do think it's a wonderful vision if we can adhere to it and make it possible to make sure that this next generation of commercial habitats is reflective of the international collaboration that goes on within the space community, like the ISS tells this wonderful story with all the nations that are involved. I have one more question for you, myself, as the moderator's privilege here, um, but then we'll begin to take questions from the audience. So last question for Great. me, for you, Mike, tell us about how you think about the Earth-Moon system and the future of habitation. Where does Axiom fit into a LEO economy, and then perhaps in the future, a cis-lunar economy or, or a lunar economy? That's a great question because we um, tend to speak about ourselves as, as building the LEO economy, but there is an extension of that. First of all, cis-lunar space is, a, is, a, is the beginning really from my perspective uh, as, a, as an exploration step. I really think when we go well beyond uh, the cis-lunar space to uh, to Mars and beyond, that really the, the way the human should travel instead of what we've discussed in the past, which is drag your, your spacecraft that's going to bring you home with you all over the universe, which is a terrible waste of mass, um, is uh, this idea that this inner space is this great location, low gravity location, that low gravity, gravity well location that, that puts you in a great position to, to come home and and so I think this lunar space is going to be is going to turn out to be sort of the the secret spot that's going to connect uh, travel beyond uh, really Earth and uh, other planets. We're going to utilize this lunar space really for the last part of that travel, the first part of that travel, and the last part of that travel for the humans anyway. Uh, and so this lunar space is going to be key. And of course, as a company, what we do is we build uh, habitats, if you will. Um, that support life and and other uses and uses in low Earth orbit that require uh, either a temporary um, human presence or permanent human presence. And so, of course, the lunar space is going to be one of those as well. It's a natural uh, evolution for us. Um, we also uh, will build our own uh, EVA suit, our spacewalk suit, which is also something that that's needed in the lunar space. So yeah, there's a lot of evolution, and while we we don't talk about it much, we we certainly uh, look to the future that way. And ultimately, for us, um, there's there's two aspects of what we're doing. One, of course, and of course for us, it's all about humanity, you know, stepping off the Earth and and moving to other planets. But so so for us, the way I think we're going to go from cis lunar to Mars and back is really more in a in a spacecraft, more like what we're building. Uh, in, in low Earth orbit, it's got to be kind of large. It'd be nice if it had uh, uh, exercise equipment or even a rotating section, so the you know the the crew stays healthy for the trip there and back. Uh, it needs to have plenty of of capability and redundancy and and uh, and plenty of logistics on board. And so all of these really point to a spacecraft that's more like the ones that that we're designing for. For, uh, for low Earth orbit. So ultimately, as a company, I don't know if we see cis lunar space, 
as an important location, but this idea of how we get from cisgender space to Mars or cisgender space to Jupiter is that kind of spacecraft is something we think is naturally uh, something we'll, we'll get involved in. Mm -hmm. And as a quick follow-up to that, of course, we're following plans for a gateway on NASA's side for this station that they intend to have in orbit around the moon to support lunar surface activity. Do you similarly anticipate that there might be parts of an Axiom station in the future that are uh, seasonal? So in the same way that Gateway is intended to only be partially occupied or because Axiom station at least initially will be in low Earth orbit, the transit times are much shorter, do you anticipate you know, full steady state operation of most of the modules that you would be putting into orbit? We, you know, again, we kind of focus on this permanent presence in a platform and in, in, in low Earth orbit, but the, the, all of our spacecraft are designed to um, either have humans on board or not. Either way, the, they'll fly, they'll take care of themselves and be fine. So we certainly can evolve to that. I, I would prefer to see us ultimately uh, create a presence in this lunar space that's more permanent. Um, and and it's a it's kind of a part of a, even like the name implies, gateway. You know, it's a place for us to perhaps bring crew, they rest before they start their long journey and, and those sorts of things. So um, I, I think the evolution is going to go the other way. We're starting short duration because they're, they're trying to figure out exactly how to best utilize the spacecraft. But ultimately, I think permanent presence is, is, is where we're going to end up. But with that said, absolutely, we can support um, uh, we call it human tended, where you go for short periods of time. And in fact, we're already working on a design of, this, of a spacecraft. Uh, all of our modules fly standalone anyway, and that's, an, that's important is because when they get old, you want to just separate the one and let it deorbit on its own, but it's got to safely deorbit. So, so every spacecraft can fly itself. But, but the reason why that's also very important to us is because Ultimately, there are still researchers that want to have a pure microgravity environment. We assume manufacturers will as well. So, so separating and flying in a co-located orbit is also another aspect of it, and that is definitely a man-tended sort of function. Yeah, indeed. And it's falling on friendly ears, of course, what you're saying here, because many of us, this is the vision we want, permanent outposts, being able to know and plan that we have a solid footprint, so to say, in low Earth orbit for humanity, and then also moving that capability out into the moon as well. But mm -hmm. it's interesting to hear that, you know, of course, Axiom is also focused on the autonomy required to be able to have the, the individual modules be self-flying, which is, which is key. To take the first question now from the audience, from Christy Akuf, hopefully I'm saying that name correctly, will Axiom be hiring its own astronaut corps to take care of the station while experimenters use the platform? How can one begin to get familiar with the systems on board and the skills needed to be part of this core? Uh, the answer to that is uh, yes. Um, in the fact, the way we fly, as, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we also are flying missions as part of a preparation phase to get ready to operate our uh, space station uh, in conjunction with, uh, with the ISS operators and we're flying flights about we want to fly about twice a year to the international space station all of our flights actually have professional astronauts that are employees of of, uh, of axiom and we think that's that's critical to the well-being and and safety of that flight and the iss and her crew we just think that's a critical function and then of course once our station gets up there we have an obligation uh, to have uh, uh, crew members there that can can operate and maintain the space station. So that doesn't just mean Axiom astronauts. We can use international astronauts to help us with that. But our current belief is that we should have at all times an Axiom employed astronaut uh, on board as well. So that, that certainly is our intent. Um, as far as, as getting involved in our systems and stuff, you, you can go to the website and uh, uh, we, we feed some of that information along the way. Uh, if you're very interested, uh, we have internships, and of course, we're hiring. Uh, uh, we're hiring like crazy. We're we're at 137, and we have to be at 300 this year. And so, so if you're interested, we'd love to we'd love to talk to you. Indeed, that opens up a nice opportunity here to talk a little bit about the civilian mission. So, of course, Axiom's looking at training your own employees, as you're mentioning, to always have an Axiom employed astronaut in the context of the operations of the station. Um, but for the civilian mission that's coming up, I believe it's next January, right? No earlier than January of mm -hmm. uh, 
too. Tell us a little bit more about what you have planned and why that's a special milestone. Well, it's special because it's the first um, private mission to the International Space Station. So that's very exciting, of course, for us. Um, it's, you, you know, this is, uh, there's a lot of firsts in all this, and it starts with the mundane part of trying to do a contract with NASA doing something that, that they've never done before and we've never done before. So the biggest challenge of uh, probably this mission in, in the last few weeks has been getting all the contracts in place, which has been pretty exciting. But um, really, the, it, it, it is groundbreaking. There's a, there's a couple aspects of that. You know, first of all, honestly, tourism is sort of looked as, uh, well, let me back up and say, in the early days of the International Space Station, tourism was not appreciated, is what I'll say. Um, and so we're, we, you know, now that I do what I'm doing now, I, I realize that that is, that's furthest from the truth because these first few flights are really groundbreaking. It's helping everybody else, A, understand that it's possible for pretty much anybody to fly, and B, how do I figure out how to get people that aren't just, you know, wealthy able to, to come to low Earth orbit? So these are important things. And so these first flights, while they are people that have more resources than most of us, they are also individuals that can make the biggest difference for all of us on the ground. They tend to have uh, philanthropic efforts, uh, which can focus on uh, on many things that help us. But they also, most of these guys are entrepreneurs. They start businesses, um, you know, like you and I write papers. You know, so it's it, these kind of people that people can make a big difference. Uh, the three that are flying on this flight, an international crew, which is very, very important to us. They're all very philanthropic oriented. They are all working on efforts to, to uh, further their particular interests, and we've got some group interests as well. And, uh, and also, what is really big to us is that we are flying our, our uh, own professional astronaut. It's really, uh, it's, it's a bit groundbreaking for us to do what we're doing, and uh, it's nice that we have uh, such a, a um, well-respected uh, astronaut, and Michael Lopez Astro uh, Alegria, who's part of our company, uh, that's that's going to lead that first mission. So uh, there's a ton of firsts, which makes it quite exciting in and of itself. But I think the complement of crew and what they'll be able to do, and what they will do when they get home, is is uh, is very important. Well, may it be the first of many. It's a it is a really exciting milestone. And we have a related question that's just come in from Jim Gray as we're bringing up this topic of of space tourism and expanding the ranks of who gets to go into space, who gets to be an astronaut. What are the biggest psychosocial challenges, solutions to challenges, and perhaps opportunities of expanding the number of people living for long periods of time in low Earth orbit or even farther out? Uh, well, that is, that is, of course, a big question mark. And uh, it, it is, as you can imagine, part of what we have to consider when we, when we uh, contract for these flights is to make sure that we are um, not only discussing the rules of the road and what thou shalt do, but there, you know, you have to do a psychological evaluations and things like that just to m make sure. But it's inevitable the larger the community gets in uh, in I anywhere, but the larger the community gets, the the more likely you're going to have some of these sorts of challenges. And to us, that's you know that. In my way of thinking, when we start really dealing with those, we'll know that we've been successful. When we have a large community of people in, in, in one place, I think we'll feel pretty good about it uh, because we know we've got so many that we've, we've been successful. But that's, I didn't answer your question because I really don't know the answer to your question right now. But it is something we're very cognizant of, and we work very hard to make sure when the crews fly that they will be compatible with their crewmates. But eventually, we're just going to get so big that, that you, you can still do those things. But ultimately, uh, once you get to orbit, you know, some, some things happen. And, and really, lower to orbit is going to be where the early training will occur. So it's natural to expect that occasionally you're going to run into some challenges and we'll have to be able to deal with them. I know NASA has a long history of, you know, very thoughtful, intentional pairings and vetting for NASA astronauts, thinking about what does it take to be one of those select few, a top, top, top percent of human talent. And of course, as we're expanding the ranks of who has the opportunity to access to go into space, there are a lot of questions, I think, in people's minds about 
what training will be necessary? Will they be able to perform and, and uh, have a stable mentality when they're in a space environment like an orbiting station where if they were to make a mistake or open the wrong air hatch, open the wrong airlock, it could you know, cause damage to the crew. And so there's interesting questions to answer for safety, but I think Jim's also pointing in his question to the amazing opportunities to democratize access to this arena, which Axiom is looking to do. And it's also a mission that we share in the Space Exploration Initiative. And some of the work that we've talked about earlier today is what is it like to design a habitat that's not just for that top percentage of human talent, these amazing astronauts that are so well-trained, but what is it like to design a habitat, the interiors, the artifacts, the musical instruments, the entertainment, um, the space food that will also empower and delight this next generation that's hopefully going to uh, get to experience space in a, in a bigger and broader way. So we're very excited to stay tuned and stay along with Axiom's development as the infrastructure to, to build up into this potential to share broader experiences of microgravity and life in orbit. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Mike, do you have any final comments for the group today? We'll have time for probably one more, one more thought and then we'll prepare to close. Um, you know, what I'll say is I, I'm, I'm impressed with what you guys are doing in your institute. It's, it's very exciting, but I, I didn't get a chance to talk about Tesseray, but Tesseray is a very exciting thing that, that we're collaborating with you on. Uh, it's a, you know, self-assembling structures in space, and it's such uh, an it, it exciting thing to go study, and we really look forward to taking advantage of it. So we're not just building a platform for the kinds of things we can think of today. I mean, self-assembling of structures is pretty uh, pretty exciting. So I wanted to give you a shout out to the Tesseray project. That's a, that's a big deal for us too. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's very nice to hear that. And we are very excited to continue looking at ways to collaborate with Axiom in the future. And with that, I'll okay. say let's all thank Mr. Suffredini again and the Axiom team for joining us today. If you were in front of the audience, you heard a bunch of clapping, but I will do it for our <laughs> webinar participants and for everyone who's joined us throughout the day today, not just in this webinar, but on the live stream on Facebook and on YouTube. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really happy to have been able to pull Beyond the Cradle back together again this year. Not quite in person, but stay tuned for 2022. And um, thank you again for all of your time and for, and for spending time with us today. If anyone's interested in following along with the activities of the Space Exploration Initiative, I believe we have a final slide that just shares our handles and our website and, and how you can stay involved. And with that, I will formally close Beyond the Cradle. And Mike, thank you so much again for being part of our event finale. It was fantastic to have you. My, my pleasure. Thank you, Ariel.